Just leave on two, clear take off, left hand. Take off left, it is speed one. Clear left, speed west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. It's my great pleasure to welcome back to the program Group Captain Anil Kumar Ghosh. Uh, Group Captain Ghosh, as we know, was commissioned into the fighter stream in May of 1962. He flew vampires and then uh, converted to Canberras. He flew Canberras during the 71 war, and that's something we spoke to him about in a previous episode. Uh, but today we're going to be speaking about uh, Group Captain Ghosh's experience during the IPKF in Sri Lanka. So welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you, Gons. Let me start army style for your audience. A little bit about the geography of uh, Sri Lanka and subsequently what exactly was the situation in 87, 88 when we got involved and where do I come into the picture? That will be very useful. So just a little bit of the okay. background of the conflict would be great. Sir. So if you have a look at the map of Sri Lanka, it is like a teardrop with a small little bulge in the north and uh, which is like a little smudge and actually that is the Jaffna Peninsula mm -hmm. the rest of, which is separated from the rest of the country by a little area, jungle area and all that so that is a very small area actually roughly 50 nautical miles by about 35 nautical miles in that area was where all the action was taking place. Now, in getting back to historical perspective, in 87, middle of 87, there was a lot of turmoil in Sri Lanka, in their, I mean, Sinhala area. And this was a Tamil area. This, this, this area, uh, which I pointed out, was almost 90% Tamil. And there was a guy called Prabhakaran who came up. He was actually a local, not exactly a hero, but a, a tough guy who eliminated all the other competition and he became the leader of the Tamil. And he formed an organization called the LTTE, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Islam. Now, those days was uh, we had a Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and uh, he had some ideas of his own. So he sort of, this guy was sort of encouraged. And he was molly coddled and he was brought to Delhi. But unfortunately, he was not happy with the treatment where he got in Delhi. He was brought by a BSF Agro all the way to Delhi, entertained, winded and dined over here, and then finally went back. Because the turmoil in uh, Sri Lanka was reaching a peak. The Tamils wanted to eat independence. The LTT aim was to form Elam. Elam is the land of motherland of Tamils. So that meant separation from the Sinhala heartland. The Sinhala heartland didn't like that, so they were, we were heading for a day. The, there were a lot of Tamil going on in Sri Lanka itself. Now, that was the time when President Jayavardhane, who was the wily fox, he sort of outsmarted uh, Raji Gandhi and brought him into the picture and formed the, what you call the Indira Gan, uh, what you call the accord, Indo Sri Lankan accord in July 87. Right, right. Okay. So that accord 
the Tamils were not exactly in a position to, you know, declare independence and so. But all the same, they were getting a lot of encouragement from, from uh, Indian side. But uh, this guy sensed it and he sort of uh, checkmated this uh, position by signing the Sri Lankan Accord. With the Tamils, if when they were cornered, they said, okay, you are not going to surrender to Sinhala, but we are willing to surrender to India. So that is why the Indian peacekeeping force went in. This is the first independent peacekeeping force outside the United Nations who went on to establish peace. And that was in August. Some units of 54 division, which were based in Sikandarar, moved into Sri Lanka and they said, we will look after this ceasefire. <laughs> so the Tamils started surrendering the weapons to the um, Indian forces at various places under the auspices of 54 division. But then in October there was an incident, one boat was intercepted by the Indian Navy and that boat was heading probably for Thailand or some place. But it had some 12 big LTT leaders on board. And they were taken captive and brought to Jaffna. Jaffna airfield, which is called Palali, which is 20 kilometers from Jaffna town. And Palali airfield was a small hangar sort of thing where they used as a transit for passengers, you know, they were kept over there. So, uh, this, there were a lot of negotiation between the Indian side and the Sri Lankan side. The Sri Lankan side, these guys are in Sri Lankan waters, they have violated Sri Lankan law, so therefore they should be handed over to us, which was a part of the accord. If anything like this happens, we would hand over to them. I mean, smugglers or any other activity. But then there was a hesitancy on our side. So for a couple of days, there was a lot of bhatti going on behind the scenes. And Mr. J. N. Dixit, who was the Chanakya of <laughs> that particular time, the father of the president, uh, present uh, is external affairs minister. He sort of said, okay, we'll hand over to the, we'll hand over these guys to the Sri Lanka, let them do whatever they have to do. Because after all, it's a part of the, after all, it's a part of the accord. So that was the time on 12th of October, when in lunchtime, when uh, our Indian guards were being replaced by Sri Lankan guard, these charts smelt rat. So they had their lunch capsules, the lunch capsule being lunch uh, uh, packets. Each of the lunch capsule packets had a cyanide capsule. And there were two main leaders in that, their packets contained two. So after lunch, they swallowed the cyanide capsule and all of them collapsed. There and then and there in Japanata. And then they were rushed to the local Sri Lankan military hospital and all them, none of them happened, all of them died. So then Prabhakaran who had by now gone back to his headquarters in some other side in the jungle, so he sort of declared war. He literally went on the hooter and declared war. And the, I, against the IPK and all the attacks on the various IPK camps started at that particular time. Now, IPK had gone there for peace chemo operation. So, army battalion, Jawan Johnny were there, but they had their light weapons, but not heavy weapons, like tanks or motors or any other stuff or anything else. So, that had to be flown in almost overnight. When fire was started, somebody in Delhi decided that, okay, this is, this is it, then we'll go to the uh, full Monty and then they started uh, 2nd Brigade from Jhansi, uh, which was T-72 tanks and BMP, they were overnight lifted there. Then a huge amount of uh, uh, 
air activity at that particular time. Almost two brigades were moved in almost overnight from everywhere. And these two brigades were, one was 41 brigade, which was earmarked for the task for the main capture of Daphna town and Daphna area. And the other area is 47 brigade, uh, 114 brigade and so many others. So in this small area of 50 kilometers by 35 kilometers, some five brigades were pumped in over a period of time, starting from October. And there was heavy fighting going on. The, but the LTT was prepared. We were not prepared. I mean, our guys went in there, they didn't even have maps. Our guys were flown in almost overnight and told to go north northward. <laughs> they didn't have a map to very move. So, <laughs> there were a lot of chaos. So, this was the time when I was posted to ATAC. ATAC was at one core. And one core is a core which is earmarked for Pakistan. <laughs> the strike core. But eight, one core units were all moving to Sri Lanka. So when I moved to my unit to take over my unit sometime in uh, November, the <coughs> my unit is already ready to move on a train. But we were told to wait, hold on, hold on. The final word is, will come later. So almost, and by the time the fireworks had already started in this thing, and Air Marshal, late Air Marshal Nakwi, who was my 83rd post, I knew well, good friend. He was there as he was put as Jaffna base commander and he was uh, opting with uh, 54 uh, division. So, 41 went in, 41 brigade went in, and other brigades went in. Artillery we used, tanks were used, aircraft were not used, only armed helicopters were used. Armed helicopters, Mi 24 from uh, uh, 125 helicopter units. Which is now with Mi 35. Mi 24 is the predecessor of the Mi 35. So uh, the armed helicopters used just like fighter aircraft because they had weapons and armament. Later on, the Mi 8s were converted with uh, rocket pods and they were also used. So a lot of things happened, a lot of things. 41 Brigade commander was. Brigadier uh, Manji Singh is a postmate of mine, ND postmate of mine. And he told me much later that they suffered 249 dead. Almost one third of the battalion was killed in the operation because of the LTT simply massacred them. And, but they went in because he was a bull, he, frontal assault, he had a lot of that, lot, lot, lot. So, but then he was one of General Sundarji's favorite generals, so he pushed on and carried on. And ultimately, General Sundarji has said, oh, give us one week and we will overrun Jatna. It took almost a month. So I landed up there in the middle of uh, November sometime. Right. So can I just uh, pause you here? Uh, can you just explain for the audience what is a TAC and what is the TAC's role and therefore, you know, how were you tasked to move to Jaffna? A TAC, uh, a TAC is a tactical air center. It consists of uh, two flying officers and the rest are technical officers. We basically have uh, the air-to-ground equipment for the air-to-ground communication. So we move with the army to direct the air force to army tag. That's the role of tag and pastime. <laughs> the role of tag and pastime is not very well defined. So they use for anything and everybody anywhere. So that's why the tag tag was not used in this particular operation. But the tag commander was used because they needed bases. Initially we set up two bases, one at Palali, which is Jaffna, and one at Trinkomali. Trinkomali is the northeastern area in the eastern area. There were two uh, areas of uh, Sri Lanka, the northeastern area and the uh, northern area and the eastern area. Northern area was Jaffna, eastern area was Trinkumar. Jaffna area was 90% Tamil and 10% Sinhala. The Trinko area is 
one third Tamil, one third uh, Sinhala, and one third other like Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, and so on and so forth. So Trinko was not a very hot set, but Jaffna was a hot sector from day one because that was the heartland of the Tamil. So TAC was not really used in this. It was only the TAC commanders who were put as base commanders at this particular place to coordinate, uh, basically transport and helicopter operation and uh, things like that. You see, in staff college, they tell you joint operation at battalion level and brigade level. Here you are dealing with company level operation. You know, small, small helicopter operation and so you are dealing with company commanders and VA commanders and the uh, uh, GS of the division. GSO2 or GSO1 or GSO2 of the division. General Staff Officer of the division. Who is the main ops man. So you to go to them to coordinate you tell you what exactly requirement, where are they going, what are the operations and we will say okay fine, uh, you need so many helicopters and we will or uh, so many strikes by May 24 and so on and so forth, like that. That was the basic thing which was going on there. I mean, what was established after the initial confusion of, uh, of moving in straight to, into things like this. Because in that Jaffna area, you know, there are three basic. The northern eastern part of the thing is marshland, not fit for tank and all that. The southern area that is south of Filnoti in that area is thick forest called uh, Bavunia and all those places, those are forested areas. And uh, in the plains and the plateau area is the urban area of Jaffna which is which spread out town. They were all narrow roads but all hell of a lot of roads and criss crossing at, uh, at right angle. So these are the roads, initially the Indian army wanted to follow and that's why they got massacred. The armored brigade lost 11 uh, heavy vehicles, uh, armored, 3 tanks, 372 tanks, 3 T-72 tanks and about uh, uh, 8 BMP. Because each and every intersection in that area was mined. And some were mined with tons of explosives, enough to blow a tank, you know, to bits, literally. Wow. Uh -huh. One tank, uh, main hull was found one kilometer from the place where it is, and practically, of course, naturally nobody survived. So it's, uh, it, this is the hard lesson that we have to don't follow the road, whatever you do. Even, either you, you can't take vehicles, so you march. If you have uh, tanks and uh, BMPs, then you go by the side, but don't go anywhere near the body, center of the body. So as you go deeper and deeper into the town, the more and more difficult to get. So that's why they took hell of a lot of casualties, which 241 brigade, which is the main assault brigade, and the other one which are completely. Uh, I forget the numbers of the. 54 division was there initially. The it was 41 brigade we went for the main assault. 47 brigade, which is also <laughs> commanded by another course mate of mine, Brigadier Dhawan. And uh, there was another guy in the northeast called Brigadier Samar Ram. He was one on four brigade. He was also a course mate, but not an NDA course mate. He was in a direct entry. So I had three course mates out of that. Entire setup, army setup, I had three course mates and my person in the RT brigade commander, he was also a course mate of mine. He was looking at the ground defense of uh, Jaffna airfield, I mean Palali airfield. And some other guys who were, you know, one course, two course, up and down, they were all there. So we combined business with pleasure. We interacted with each other on personal level and delivered whatever they want. Air Force, whatever Air Force could give, they gave. They gave much more than what they were supposed to give. But same same thing with the Army. I mean, they helped out our and 
we were well protected in uh, unit so so that shape of that was really what the india spirit was all about sir So, so how many aircraft or which aircraft did you have army you had their aero from your side or they had their aeropi army okay. had the aeropi their light helicopter the army had the cheetahs and the chetak from six aeropi they were also based in the same place in kalari i think hmm. were those Kalari. armed or were those purely for observation and casual no 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 they were hmm. they were they were armed also hmm. there were local modification some of the cheetahs were uh, armed with uh, lmg not lmg my machine gun and they were called ranjits <laughs> the local name was ranjit but they were floating around trying to give support to the but this is very difficult in a urban area when you are fighting house to house and lane to lane is very very difficult so that's where fortunately there were no air co- helicopter casualties in fact right in the two years uh, of air hectic air operation uh, we lost only one helicopter due to genuine accident that we were trying to land in trincomalee and trincomalee didn't see the grass he, there was a tree stump hidden by mm. grass and oh. one wheel hit and he toppled over fortunately there were no fire no uh, casualties but the helicopter was not that was the only accident that we had but we were flying but we did have a lot of helicopter damage because of small arms fire and so on so one was particularly this uh, case of a uh, sikh li unit dropped yes, in yes of course were you there then sir were you there at that time i was not there during the planning and execution but i was there immediately afterward <laughs> what so happened was that you don't know that incident yeah if you can just describe the incident say what happened i will tell you the sikhli unit uh, this unit commander came and asked the helicopter that i say can you drop us here he said of course i can drop you here what's the problem so that is how you know things were uh, happening before we started planning things a little systematic so three helicopter was it four i think three helicopter uh, dropped uh, about uh, 30 odd uh, johnny some sikhlet and they dropped them in uh, there was a two story three story building in the next to that was a big field that is where they dropped them that was supposed to drop them they dropped them but they came under fire straight away because the lmg the ltt had lmg on the um, second floor and third floor they were pinned up and they were in the open so it is total shock to them and first time thing like that happening in fact in in the second the helicopter dropped them went back again to pick up the rest again went back did second time again came under fire and these chaps inside they were frozen they were at literally had to be pushed out and they had no idea what was happening in the warrant officer of the thing had shoved out their ammunition boxes which were kept along with them the other way they would have landed up there without body ammunition so he literally shoved the ammunition on board and dropped them and came back third drop again the aircraft got damaged but after that they said we can't do any more because i mean it was a full of hole but fortunately all three acres were hit all three acres were damaged but not to that extent that they couldn't fly so that was uh, what it was as far as the sickle i think was a disaster out of uh, 30 people 29 were killed yes. only one chap survived yeah. and he was captured he was wounded and he was captured later on later on he was released by the lnd but this was a disaster and the of course there was supposed to be a link up with this was at night and there was supposed to be a link up with the ten para unit which was coming along by road that unfortunately never happened and uh, so this unit were right now so 
we got some bad press but especially there was a nasty letter written about how the air force had dropped the army at the wrong place so they were uh, you know they were written off and they mentioned some place which was adjacent to this particular field where they were actually dropped a smaller much smaller elephant so i when i came to know about it i found some of the press reporters but he floating around i this was much later i said i took them in a helicopter and took them over ahead and showed them that this is where we support to drop and this is where we actually drop and you say that we have dropped them here but this is a much smaller place you can see there are so many obstructions all around and it is difficult to land here in the daytime and later on at night how is it possible so anyway there were no comments and all that and all that was ultimately forgotten but from my side i made it sure there was it was not exactly a fault of the air force the air force should have thought a little more no doubt but but uh, what was the air force was asked to do we did we too bad that the uh, results were not commensurate with all the effort that we put in but that's how it is in war sometimes you win sometimes you lose so that is one uh, aspect of uh, that jaffna university drop was a disaster but but some other other we re- recoup from that and carried on the right, right. and you know the ltt i believe used to describe the may 25 as the alligator the crocodile you know and it really that is a aircraft that they truly were fearful of and it was extremely effective the the thing, ltt is to call the uh me 24 the crocodile we they were deadly scared of the me 24 me 24 had that uh, uh, high rate of fire machine gun plus it would carry rocket pod just like any other fighter aircraft and i will tell you an incident uh, about this later but uh, this is uh, in fact uh, <clears throat> by the time I, I came in the month of november and settled down by december we, we are sort of settled and the operation lies in with the army and operation or you know going on every day was different every day was a separate incident there were a lot of helicopters already launched in the small small islands all around jaffna peninsula that we used to launch them in the morning go and the the aircraft to drop them the troops need to clear up the place and the evening aircraft will pick them up this is a uh, standard uh, island operation on here so most of the islands were cleared from the ltt but uh, other thing was most of us what is were cadwack mission both from helicopters i mean helicopter picking up casualties from various places uh, light helicopters from uh, by the army and uh, our heavy helicopter those days we had me 8 we didn't have me 17 me 17 came later so me 8 should carry about 28 people so that was also good they were also modified by the rocket pods and all that but they were also used but rockets fired in jungle area are not very effective because the jungle layer was too thick rocket used to explode on top of the trees but nothing which you have on the ground that we learned much later after uh, the army went in and see how much exactly the damage was done so we discussed it too much of air effort was not done by me it but a lot of casual effort was there mm-hmm. okay i give you one small incident sometime in the month of december uh, there was a sorty i mean ground sorty done by about a small unit of uh, a team uh, 10 para 10 para is located in the airfield in here only okay so these guys had gone to a place called chavak teri which is in the northeast and further up chavak teri is a hot ltt area and uh, they had gone further up on some other thing and when they continued the mission they were coming back in the evening they were about four jeeps okay the officer was captain sonal 
I still remember his name. And he was in front. He was not wearing a helmet. And he was with a driver who was wearing a helmet. They were coming back and they took a sort of U-turn on the road. And on the U-turn was a two-story building. So as they approached this building to take a turn, there were two LTT snipers on the second floor of the building. Two of them. Both fired. Both fired more or less at the same time. One aimed for the driver, one aimed for the officer. Okay. The driver got hit and collapsed straight away. He was killed instantly because the bullet went through the head. And second trap, in spite of wearing the helmet, okay, the second bullet which was heading for the officer, he realized something is happening in his sixth sense and because he had commando body instinct, he put his head down. And the bullet was heading for his center of his forehead, now entered on top of his this thing and came out just above his spine. So, <laughs> he, he was conscious, he was alert, he told his SNCO who was coming behind him, he said, I am hit, take over. Okay. And the SNCO was seeing what was happening in front of him. He didn't wait for him to say, take over. He, he had a uh, Carl Gustav RPG ready on his shoulder and he fired. All this whole activity took place in less than 15 seconds. So, oh, two fired, driver was killed, officer was injured, he retaliated, the second floor of the building was taken out, but then the officer, the DCO transmitted, my officer is injured, uh, we need cash back. Now, this is somewhere near 5 o'clock in the evening. We just started getting dark and it was getting mist and all that. There was no weather was generally cloudy, but it was misty and visibility not, not, not all that good. Mm. So, that evening we were planning night flying, routine night flying for our normal helicopter boys just to keep their hands in. So, we had <coughs> one aircraft ready. And in the night flying, we were also giving our waiters and uh, NCs who are uh, supporting our uh, air experience. <laughs> so, so, they were supposed to go from the air experience and one helicopter was about to get one. So, I said, okay, okay. Then that's why the CO, Colonel Dolby Singh came running. I was in the ATC. He said, sir, so, we have a problem. We need a casual accelerator. I said, okay, so, fine. Where? Okay, then I told the Air Force, uh, Air get a bolt, we'll give you direction from the air. Then I told him, that, then he brought out a map and told somebody, okay, this is this is a particular point, where is it? Okay, are there any place over there? I said, no, no, whatever it is, it is a clear area, but we don't know how to spot the diesel. So you tell your jeeps to position in four corners and put their headlights on. Okay. But there will be other lights in that area also, so tell them to flash their headlight so that this guy spots the helipad. Okay. So, some other, the, this guy gets there, he was given direction to go to the airport, he spotted the helipad, he came down, he picked up the casualty and he brought him back to uh, Palali Airfield. Then he was unloaded and we had a uh, Sri Lankan Air Force, uh, Sri Lankan Army Hospital in the airfield, small one, it was manned by Indian doctor, so we took him there, the guy was conscious, but by that time, edema has set in, edema is swelling, okay, so this guy said, we can't do anything here, he had to be evacuated, and he had to be operated in body embargo on sending a helicopter across the state at night, so I rang up, is a commander Shinde who was the boss on Chennai uh, at that time, and uh, I mean OC headquarters. They said, "I got this problem. 
have to have to do this job. I'm sending him by helicopter. I'm getting the helicopter fitted with extra fuel tanks. So he was shocked. He was one of those, you know, paper tigers, not going away from the rules and all that. So he 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 shocked. He says, "Sir, listen to me. He says, if this boy dies here tonight, the Air Force credibility will be below zero. You can't say that just because I can't fly at night and I can't cross the prospect. I say, we please do something. Send a helicopter if you can. If you don't send the uh, 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 some air, aircraft by such and such time, I'm launching this helicopter. You can remove me from that tomorrow, but I'm launching this helicopter. You have to reach hospital today." Tonight, so I did that. There was some hot water, and you finally I was about to launch the helicopter when the AN-32 landed. AN-32 landed. He was loaded on the AN-32. Some people from the unit went on and took him there. And uh, and I remember <laughs> telling his this boy was conscious at that time. We were telling this boy before he was loaded to the AN-32 that so. When I get back, I want another chance of those, you know, blinkety blank. <laughs> so, so he said, "Yeah, yeah, you'll get it, Tan. You'll get it." Tan. So that is the story of Captain Sonal. Captain Sonal is very much alive today. He was boarded out of the army, obviously, because injury was too much. But today he is a counterinsurgency expert. He writes books, and he is based in Pune. I am not in touch with him, but he is very much alive. So to that extent, I am happy that uh, he could make it. So these are the things which was a sort of every week there will be some something like this, some experience like this. Every week a day was different, and every week was different. Mm-hmm. So, so that's uh, how it is. So I had two tenures in initially in November. It is uh, by the way before that. Um, I was uh, in Westnay Command, and uh, I had got my dear John letter, and I was posted to TAC because I knew this was my last posting, and so I was I was all set for a sort of armchair buddy uh, tenure. But but fate ruled otherwise. But anyway, nothing nothing uh, nothing to complain about. So in my tenure, the I was. Initially, in December, January, the fireworks were almost over, and the mopping up operation was going on till end of January. After that, we sort of settled down, you know, like the army usually does. You know, uh, when you go to a new place, settle down, learn the language, learn the history of the place, and so on and so forth, and carry on. So in My tenure, the two uh, divisions, one fifty-four division and thirty-eight division, took over. Then they decided to induct in one more division, four division, which was in Allahabad to uh, Bhavonia. They activated Bhavonia. Bhavonia was active before that, but very small scale of it. It was sort of transit base, but now it became a full-fledged base, and a lot of activities, uh, operational activities. Started in Bhavonia because by that time the LTT operation had shifted out from the urban areas and headed for the jungle. Jungle is the south of south of uh, urban portion of that. Yeah. Okay, so lot of transport activity. IL seventy six, IL N thirty two, so on and so forth. So most of the time it was uh, like this. So. Was it not? Did, did you get an opportunity to go for some of the offensive missions yourself? In oh Canada? yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was not ground based. I was flying all over the place. I was not <laughs> like I was uh, flying. Sometimes I flew uh, missions on not live missions, but I flew in the front cockpit of a Mi twenty four. Which is as good as a fighter cockpit, and uh, gonna uh, then uh, later on uh, we got this uh, 
एलोट हेलीकॉप्टर आर्म्ड विथ मिसाइल एस इलेवन एस इलेवन मिसाइल ए टू थाउजेंड मिसाइल हाँ तो हम मानो तो क्यू एयरफोर्स पर्सन जो पायलट मिसाइल टी की बोट सो आई डोंट वेरी गॉड आई हिट नो नॉट बट ऑल दिस इट इज अ ग्रेट एक्सपीरियंस सो इज लाइक दैट देन मी एट लिटिल बिट ऑफ फ्लाइंग हेट एंड देर टू टीम एंड मेरी प्लेसेस वी टू हैव रेगुलर कुरियर्स सिंस वी हैड फाइव ब्रिगेड वी हैड फाइव ब्रिगेड हेड क्वार्टर्स एंड वी हैड रेगुलर मी एट कुरियर्स गोइंग अराउंड द प्लेस इन द पेनिनसुलर एरिया ओके so couriers didn't really develop mail shield and anything or pick up any casualty or somebody going on leave and all that and drop him to palali like that okay so these this was in my first tenure so here some place we would pick up crab some place we would pick up lobster some place we would pick up venison deer meat You know, thing like that. We combine business with pleasure. Okay, so th- this was great. We had a great time. Uh, then, uh, then I went back, came back to the mainland, got involved in my winding up thing since I was ready to retire. But suddenly, middle of eighty-eight, AK Singh, uh, a commander AK Singh was was CAC. He is a good friend of mine, my senior coach. He said, "You are required back there again." Okay, so we are running short of people, and we want people with little experience over there. So by October '88, we came back again. I came back again for another ten years, and I stayed till February '89. Um, by that time, politics had changed, things had changed. All sorts of things are changed in Sri Lanka and India and so on and so forth. And uh, it was, I mean, this is very strange. The, I mean, we were fighting the LTT, the LTT is talking to the Sri Lankan government, the Sri Lankan government is not talking to us. All sorts of things, funny things were going on. Okay, which we could sense, but we didn't get any direct. it back in that but in the meantime there was a lot of turmoil in in uh, sri lanka sri lanka itself in fact things were so bad in colombo i was bill because we had to talk to our sri lankan counterpart then they told to to tell us base commander sri lanka was finally done and uh, he was saying that to the family then after some time the other guy got their family the cross Because things were so uncertain in Colombo itself, he said, "Jaffna was safer. <laughs> Jaffna was the offering for them was very safe <laughs> because the Indian army and the Indian Air Force looking up. <laughs> so the ladies came and added some color to our mess. Are living in a quarter. They were very fond of Hindi movies. So we showed them any number of Hindi movies, and our cooks who couldn't. Cook very seafood. They didn't know how to handle oysters and lobsters and things like that. So we taught them how to. <laughs> so we had a ball. We had a blast. Very nice. Ye uh, dethi. Nobody would ever think that there was a war going on anywhere else. Then when I landed up there, there was something suddenly. Somebody got a brainwave saying Operation Roundup. So what was Operation Roundup? Air Commodore Vasudeva, who was my senior coach, who was in the OC headquarters, came and briefed me that this is what is going to happen. We have, we were looking after northeastern Sri Lanka and eastern Sri Lanka. Now we are going to look after western Sri Lanka and southern Sri Lanka also. <laughs> Somebody had delusion of grandeur. Okay, so Operation Roundup in our terms meant that. Uh, there were only 120 or so personnel and about five six officers in that town. So we're going to take over the place. 
that is air force as well as uh, army also had maximum about another 120 of so they are going to be rounded up and uh, took over so one fine day sometime in I think the date I think October so soon after I had landed on day 3T72 tank came charging somewhere and took position on the Sri Lankan said my god I didn't know anything nobody briefed me nobody told me anything the Sri Lankan base commander he came in a cold sweat and said what the, what is going on sir what is going on sir I now I didn't know what to say so I said nothing going on just relax just tell your chap for heaven's sake do not open fire the minute anybody open the fire there will be a massacre please do not put your weapon down relax calm down well sir I'll go and sort of took him to the GSO to EO oh, did that I said yeah yeah nothing here so he made him calm down but the T-72 tranks remained in position for about 6 hours or so then suddenly they were told to withdraw so they withdrew so God knows what really happened further up because there was a intention to take over that island but somebody got cold feet and withdrew the last one but not after embarrassing all of us uh, we had built up a good reputation with the Sri Lanka both the army and not so much with the army but at least with the effort okay we had uh, so these are the things which happened in my second tenure we didn't really know what exactly was going to happen then one day one fine day announced okay rpk is going to withdraw you can go home now you don't know was group captain sota there in your times he was base commander of avunia for a few months in a time when a lot of helicopter operations were taking place because the ltt was in the jungle in the mulai to river there's a small lake over there in mulai to river where ultimately prabhakaran was killed by the sri lankan forces much later on it was somewhere that side but he had very well established headquarters at that time at that time there was some a uh, lot of uh, activity air activity going on but mostly from bobumia not so much from here and uh, we were told to go by prem prem dasa who was the sri lankan he is we don't want the ltt uh, i mean we don't want uh, rpk we can go okay so we were given 31st march 89 to withdraw we finally withdraw one month ahead of schedule it was not like what you read out read today the american leaving afghanistan and the american leaving vietnam and hanoi and all that nothing like that it was a very orderly withdrawal all move, units winding up and moving back moving back slowly slowly ultimately into this thing while in uh, uh, the, the me it's there were only two airfield aircraft detachment there and one aircraft me 24 was there but me 24 used to give the cap sortie around the area during the week it is well organized there were no casualties there was no losses no nothing and the aircraft we just put our stuff in the aircraft and the aircraft will go and army of fit my first operation sortie in 1962 was in a helicopter and my last operation sortie before i retired was also in a helicopter <laughs> on, on, on as a gunner front co pilot of a mi 24 doing a cap sortie over the thing waiting for the guy to come and finally when everybody was in we left but that was very orderly and a sensible uh, withdrawal well done well in time and well adjusted so that is the story of sri lanka a very sad story the story of lot of heroics of one place Ah, I, I didn't tell you one story, uh, a friend of mine, just to show you that what all is difficulty, problem and what all things we ultimately went through. There was a unit in Munnar, Munnar is in one corner, you know, Munnar is where the Ram Setu is, you know, the place where the Ram Setu meets uh, Sri Lanka is Munnar. 
in that corner. So there was a Bihari unit there, which was surrounded by LTP. This was, I'm telling you, sometime in my second tenure. Uh, sometime in yeah. one final day, they got attacked. They were outnumbered. The officer and two IC was killed. The JCO sent a message, SOS, to do uh, headquarters in 54 in Palali. He said, Please send somebody tonight, otherwise, tomorrow morning we won't be here. So they got activated. They flew in a small Gurkha pattern in Palali, 30 odd uh, journeys, and a young one odd also. So they came to me and said, We had to go to. General, I was told to take a range. Now, that day there was only one helicopter. Visit. So, me, uh, eight could carry about 28 at the maximum. So I told the Johnny, you will have to leave some three, couple of charge behind and we will take the rest and drop you there. He, that guy was adamant, you know sir, either we all go or we don't go. So I couldn't pull rank on him and do threaten him and this and that, I, I knew that he had his own problem. I also had my own problem and I told the pilot, Colonel Punia, late Colonel Punia. Good friend of mine. He said, you know, what do what do you do? He said, we'll defuel, sir. It reduces the fuel. Now. Just make it just amount so that we can go there and come. It's almost 25, 30 minutes flying time and 30 minutes back. So we'll that's the only thing you can do. So okay, we can remove the clamshell door. If Gurkha Jani is a small chaps, so they say Start from one on top of each other in that clamshell door with the clamshell door open. My God. <laughs> and this guy started up, lined up in one hand and took off like a conventional aircraft and turned down and went on to Munar. When they were under Munar, they were already being these uh, motors, which was the BR regiment, were now with the LTT. So they, they were pounding the buddy helipad with the buddy motors. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this guy circled and he told that officer, he said, I won't be able to stay put on the ground much. You have to go. As soon as I touch down, you have to go sharp and you'll be you're on your own after that. Yes, sir. So this guy put out his kukri shukri and uh, carried out a work right. And this guy circled. He landed, just as he landed, one bloody motor shell landed right in front of him. Damn it. <clears throat> so, so the aircraft picked up some debris. But these guys got out in time and he took off again. And he put on as much height as possible before he setting course back to base. He had not much of fuel to play around with and not much of deep time on the bloody ground. So we don't know what happened on the ground later on, but that post was saved. No doubt. And the BRE was sick. And this guy came back as I could hear him coming from a distance. I fired a couple of uh, very cartridges and he saw the airfield and landed straight away. So that was without incident. That was a touch and go operation. But so that's the story of Sri Lanka. Sir. Today, hardly anybody talks of Sri Lanka, everybody talks of Kargil, Kargil, Kargil. Nobody talks of Sri Lanka. Mm. Do you know that 1184 people never came back? 1184. Out of which almost 400 were officers. Officers leading from the front. In jungle, in sea, in family. Very sad story. We've never mentioned much when you're describing this it sounds a lot like vietnam which is you know troops being helicoptered in and then picked up in the evening on the way back uh, you know fighting um, uh, an enemy who disappears into the jungles 
uh, somewhat unprepared force who is used to fighting things in a conventional way and I think doesn't have much of this counterinsurgency, anti-guerrilla type of tactics. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the political reason or the question of why not very clearly answered for everybody. So it sounded a lot like Vietnam, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I had to restrain myself because had I really opened up, then a lot of answers would have been politically incorrect. And then you and I would have been at the receiving end. So, what a life. You can't help it. That's what I remember. But I'm, I'm, I'm only surprised. But there are I mean, the individual bravery, there were incidents, you just cannot, you know, compare things that happen. I know it doesn't compare much with what happened in Saturn Glacier or somewhere else. But still, this was in a class of its own. And here you were fighting against the enemy with one hand tied behind your back. You see, there were many instances when this guy, Prabhakaran, could have been captured. But then, as he closed in, you we, we told to hold on, hold on, hold on. So that gave him a thing to escape. I mean, that sort of such thinking is what the hell is going on. So these were all sorts of things which were going on, but I was like that charge of the light brigade, you know. I was not the reason why. I was mm. but to do and die. Do and die. Right. But a lot of people did. And a lot of people died. And not only died, 1184 people died. Twice that number came out without hands, without feet, without eyes. Because majority of the casualties were made by IEDs. IEDs, uh -huh. Big IEDs, small IEDs. Big IED is enough to blow a tank to body shut. I have seen it in my own eyes, nothing left of the body tank. And small ID is which enough to take your leg off. <laughs> it happened to <laughs> when the guys were coming in initially from the mainland. <laughs> I said, don't go out in the jungle to relieve yourself. <laughs> that will be the only one way traffic. <laughs> okay, please for heaven's sake, don't go out in the body jungle without knowing where the place is. Make sure it is safe before you step on some. So these are the many other stories, but then they'll all be censored. <laughs> thank you so much. Hi, hi, thank, you. thank you, Guns, for giving me a chance oh, okay. to re relive uh, old experiences. And uh, I had a wonderful time. I had a very Big experience will learn. I learned hello a lot, especially on man management and crisis management and things like that. I'm so grateful to you for taking the time. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, Share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhya for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.